Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Sam, this is Patrice, and we're here to talk about our new uh, launch, which I think could have some relevance across the media creation industry, and maybe even a little bit beyond that as well. It's something we've been thinking about and looking at for uh, a number of years, and uh, based on some recent deployments and some clear trends in the industry, we decided it was something that we absolutely wanted to do. Uh, so we, we've we dived in. We'll be talking today about it. It's called the Axle Dashboard. And with that, I think I will talk a little bit about how we got here. And then we can have a walkthrough. Patrice is going to be demoing the software and giving folks a sense of how it can be modified and customized for different uh, situations. And uh, uh, then we'll have a Q&A at the end. So uh, just to briefly introduce us, for those who aren't familiar, uh, we are Axle AI and the way we describe ourselves is AI powered MAM. We are based in the Boston area, but we have people around the world. Uh, we grew quite a bit over the COVID years and uh, are big believers in remote work. So uh, we have development teams in Latin America and Eastern Europe and uh, representatives who are very technical in places like the UK, India, and Malaysia. So let's talk a little bit about the dashboard. Over the years, and especially as these systems got more powerful, it became clear that people were going to need a way to visualize what was going on. Like if you have hundreds of terabytes or petabytes of content, more than anything else, you're gonna want a way to know how those transcodes are going as, the, as they're transcoded into proxies, to know how they're being analyzed for AI, to know how full your storage is and when you need to push things off to secondary or cloud storage, how busy your network is, how busy your processors are. These are all totally understandable if you have 20 terabytes of material and a Mac mini. But if you have petabytes of material and dozens of servers running Axel virtualized and containerized and in multiple sites that are coordinating with each other, that's a lot of information to integrate and you know, you don't want to be like logging in over here and seeing how busy the processor is and then logging over there and seeing how busy the storage is or how busy the GPU is for the AI. So we went looking for a broadly usable technology that could give you this dashboard view. And what we found was pretty cool stuff. We have uh, hundreds of customers at this point, uh, including some very big names. And we're delighted to be working with all these companies. I will say that we also have lots of smaller customers that are small and mid-sized teams that may not be big and famous, but are getting amazing work done. And in fact, there are industry estimates that the number of these kinds of teams is going to grow to about a million over the course of this decade. Uh, one of our biggest customers and a pilot site for the Axel AI dashboard is RTM in Malaysia. They're the national broadcaster there. We have a, a decent number of, of broadcasters as customers, but we also have corporate video, sports video, churches, universities, uh, and government video. So it's it's a fairly even mix across anybody who is capturing, editing, and creating content. So let's talk a little bit about Axel AI Dashboard. We have historically been big fans of open source. Uh, for instance, we use Elastic for our search engine. We use Postgres for our database. We use Apache as our web server, FFmpeg is our transcoder. That doesn't mean we don't plug in with proprietary things, but when an open source product is available that does a really good job of its designated task, uh, we're big fans of that. And we think the industry really appreciates it because I think the days of proprietary solutions where everything is custom are disappearing or may have already disappeared. There, there may be some very old fashioned large broadcasters that still believe in the all proprietary approach, but but we certainly don't subscribe to that and neither do our customers. And so what we've picked is a platform called Grafana for monitoring and business intelligence. And essentially it's, it's a window into what's going on with your software, your storage, your network, all the things that matter to you. And it's extremely powerful. So these are some of the things you can monitor with Grafana. And what we've done is essentially built a tool set using Grafana that's oriented towards the media and entertainment industry. And we have uh, already significant deployments of this. And because it's based on open source, everybody that's on this call and potentially everybody in the industry can just download it, start using it, 
and adapt it to the purposes that they uh, see fit. The other big thing about Grafana is its ecosystem. So it's not just cool technology with some plugins, although Patrice will certainly be showing you that. It is also an ecosystem uh, all the way down to, for instance, uh, dozens of YouTube videos telling you how to set up Grafana to monitor your network, how to set up Grafana to monitor your business, et cetera, et cetera. It's really impressive how they've been able to build this out over the last few years. And it's completely modular. You'll notice that the different interfaces being shown look almost nothing like each other. Uh, so you can take you know, widgets, drag them where you want, plug them into data sources, and essentially build your dashboard. It's super powerful. And we'd seen some commercial products that did this kind of thing and thought, oh, that would be interesting. But the costs are always a little bit out of line with the potential benefit. And here, the actual cost of the software is zero. You can run it in the cloud, in which case they do charge a hosting fee, but you can run it on your own computers very easily. It runs on Macs, on, on Intel machines, pretty much any place that has computing power. It's not very compute intensive. It's not like running transcoding on that machine or running AI on that machine. So it doesn't need you know, tons of cores or, or a big honking GPU. They make it very easy to onboard and to try the cloud version first to get up to speed and then kind of build what you need either in the cloud, if that works for you, or on-premise. And the other thing we really like is there's almost no feature gap between the cloud version and the on-premise version. There are other software products where they use the on-premise stuff as kind of a lost leader to get you to try it. And then it's like, well, if you want that feature, you need to pay us for the cloud version. Here, th there are some priced options available, but they, they really aren't part of the, the core uh, offering. And basically, it's a true open source product, which is great. And the last thing I want to talk about, and this will be leading into where we're going for, for NAB and beyond, is that as Axel has gotten more sophisticated and developed more modules, um, we've, we've gotten to the point where we have you know, a user interface element for training, for instance, for our AI engines. We have tagging, we have metadata and searching. These are all very simple. We, we still pride ourselves on being radically simple in the way we approach this, but they plug in on the back end to several different modules and you know things like Postgres is the database or FFmpeg is the transcoder or third-party transcoders or archiving tools. All of those need some kind of an overarching viewer, if you will, uh, just to make sure that you know they're healthy, they're processing, how many files went through, et cetera. And so that's really the way we see Axel Dashboard is as that top level viewer, but because it's so modular, it, it can potentially be almost anything you want it to. So this is what we see for it. You might say, well, that's all well and good, but I just, just want to use it to monitor my network traffic, my storage capacity, uh, my, my uh, computer cycles for transcoding. If you want to use it totally independent of what we do, that's great. If you have uh, completely different ideas about it, like for instance, the business intelligence type stuff, you know, monitoring your cash flow, uh, you, you can knock yourself out. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Patrice, just a brief intro to the MAM and tags. Then we can drop down a level, show uh, how Grafana interacts with those, and then maybe show some of the builder aspects of it, how you, how you can add a widget or configure a widget. Uh, I, I know some of the folks on the line may be pretty technical, so we're probably going to want to expand on that, but maybe at a high level, uh, start with uh, with what we're connecting it to. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good to me. So media asset management, as the name would suggest, is meant to help you manage and keep track of your media. And what we do is, for example, here, on my network drive, I have a bunch of folders that I have labeled yellow, and we're going to stick to the demo here. And what we do is simply show you the content of the drive with a preview, so we can play a video preview, whether it is MXF, RED, MOV, ProRes, all of that, we are going to create a low resolution preview that you will be able then to see in your browser. So how would it look? This is my network storage. Let's go to the browser. And the first thing you will see as I connect to my Axel server in, from the browser is a login page. Basically, user permissions will 
guide me as to what I am authorized to see. This system is on premise. So a system administrator is going to set the user rights. It's not a cloud solution because you want to look at what you have on premise and edit from your high speed storage. So everything remains on a cloud. And here's the demo folder I was showing you where I will see the content and I will see the video that have been created and previewed. And what we do is we are going to let a user update metadata manually, date, checkbox, drop down. But more importantly, I'm going to check another video so we have a complete set. We also use machine learning and AI to comb through your media and give you information that will help you find your media quickly. In this interview, for example, in addition to the human tagging here, you will see speech, what is being said, and where in the video this segment is being said. You have also faces, so you will see where in your video a particular person appears. And all this data is searchable, so I can search on who is on the video and where, and I can search on what is being said. In addition, we also have uh, objects, logo, so I can, for example, find the Puma logo here on the jersey for Daniel Ricciardo and so on. And I have also OCR. We use that, for example, the different numbers that is being picked up. One of our customers uh, wanted to have a number following capabilities for car racing, not Formula One, but for car racing in particular. Uh, so uh, we wanted to be able to track the numbers on a car and show in a clip where they were. In this case, they're going to show me the number from the interview. So Axel will index. I uh, will be able to tag, and we have also, also a ser an AI server that is going to watch and tell me what it sees in the video, so I will be able to, to tag, uh, to search, sorry. And here my search engine at the top. So if I wanted to search on a specific, on, on a specific file name, modification date, transcripts, actual faces, so if I want to find, for example, everything with Lewis Hamilton, I will be able to perform advanced searches or simple search, but more importantly, I will find my media. And if you think about it, we are trying to bring the same level of usability that you have on your phone for all the videos and photos you take, where instead of scrolling through the thousands of photos you take, you actually perform a search. I like personally to search on a map. That helps me a lot. Uh, I also use facial recognition, although with my twin brother, sometimes there are some issues, but that's, that's another thing. There's not much we can do about that on the model. But basically, the same level of search that you, you're so used to on your phone, we try to bring in that into the Axel server so that when you go and have petabytes of media, scattered and studied by many people that will not have the same level of consistency of, of uh, the same level of accuracy, should I say, in tagging the media with AI, we help you find all of that. And Sam likes to use the analogy as like finding your needle in the haystack. So that is Axel. Again, the AI processing is happening on the same, on another server, and it is again on premise. We do not necessarily go to the cloud. Uh, we don't want that, and our customers do not want that. They want everything to be on premise because they want to keep their media in house. They do not want to be to send it to be analyzed. So I'm going to connect, and notice it is a second interface that I am accessing. But basically, I'm going to connect and see the media that I have analyzed, including here the footage that we just saw with the face and the objects and so on, and the people that are trained. And we have also the different logos and objects that are also trained. And also some reporting, uh, such as, for example, Jimmy Fallon appearing in two videos that I have. 
And I'm showing you that so that we can segue later on to Grafana. Now on this particular server, how will I know how busy it is? Well, I will need to ring up, try to sound stupid, but I will need to find clever ways or another software to connect to my server. So that's actually an additional step. And now I'm connecting to this server and I'm just going to do a top, which is basically activity monitor from uh, my, uh, from uh, the terminal and I'll be able to see how the CPU is busy and the memory usage and everything. You can actually use some keyboard, but basically here's my third interface where I can keep track of something. And if I wanted to look at the network, basically I will have to again, bring another interface. Now that's three different interfaces that I have to go through to find something. Whether I want to find how many clips have been proxied, how many AI processes I have run through, and so on, I will need to go into the Axel MAM interface. If I want to get a report and get more detail as to who has been trained, who is appearing most in my videos, or same thing for the object, which object appear most uh, in my search, etc. I will have to again go to the tags or any kind of hardware monitoring. Now that's a perfect way to talk about Grafana. I talked about three interfaces. What is Grafana? Well, Grafana is an open source web application that will gather data and show you in one web interface a visu visual representation of this data. And you can have pie chart, bar chart, tables, uh, maps. You can have a lot of different visual representation of the data. And you access it by accessing the server. I'm going to connect to the same server where my Axel is running. Because, in a way, that's where we'll have my hardware monitoring. And here is just a quick, rough introduction here to Grafana. Uh, let me go, for example, to the past uh, 90 days and see what is happening. Now you will see here text representation as to what I have done in my server, how many assets were transcribed, how many assets I have total, how many assets were archived, or how many assets were tagged by AI. I also have how many files were added per hour, and I can track that. And I can have how many proxies were transcoded per hour. And I have this bar chart as well as the user activity. Now, I'm starting to see some information from my Axel system without having to go to my Axel interface. If I scroll down, now suddenly I'm starting to see some information from my AI server. And I will see, again, which person has been trained and I can also see their performance. GB file on appearing twice that I was showing you. And in fact, if I go back to my Axor server, you will see again Jimmy Fallon twice. And if I go to my Analyze Media, you will see the two clips that I have with Jimmy Fallon. I'm going now to go back to the Grafana interface. So I have Axor data, AI data, and my hardware monitoring data where we will see the CPU usage, how is how my CPU is busy, and that's also associated to the time. And look, I have actually a downtime. Let's zoom in on it. And I can zoom in and see exactly what is happening. So visual representation of my data. I have some gauges, I have some uh, uh, some speedometer gauges here, I have uh, uh, charts. So you will see different things that I decided to track. Now, this server is a little bit uh, underwhelming, so we are going to go to another system that we have set up that will be from my colleague in the UK. So it's actually reverse proxy in the UK. And here we go. And that will be a different one. The reason I'm going from one site to the other is to show you how modular it is. You will see that they look completely different. Yeah, I am the one doing it, so I have a little bit some of my design or poor design sense, depending on which which end of the spectrum you are. But basically, you will see the, the similar things with background color and color scheme. 
but the information shown is in different places or I have even more. For example, let's see that I have trained person 115 here as a number. I can certainly bring more details and have the same level of appearance with the charts of who appears where on this particular AI server. In this case, it's um, Alex Hamilton, not Lewis, <laughs> pardon me. And I have here Neil Blake. So these two are the top performers as to where they, uh, how often they appear in my media pool. So now from this dashboard, I can, well, see information about my assets, files in the ingested, proxy, transcoded, uh, performance in AI, who is showing up more, uh, objects, same thing. I have the button from the shirt or spectacles, linear, et cetera, showing more. Uh, same thing with the logo. So the RL, Audi logo, Nike, et cetera, are appearing often. So we have the top 10 performance and that gives me some indica quick indication in one web interface as to what I'm doing. I also like to keep track of my traffic, network traffic, to know if it is getting busy or if I have any errors. Luckily on this server, since we started to monitor in January, in the, in the second part of January, we do not have any network errors, so that's great. But if I were to notice some errors, I could try to act on it. Same thing with the storage space here, uh, read and write on the storage, and then I have more details, which basically goes to, you know, oh, how many files were added. I want to know the list of files added recently. And this is basically, tied to the time search that I have. So in the last 30 days, this is the type of inform the files that were added into my Axel system. So I can go and have more details. Same thing with the trained person, trained objects, trained logos, I can click and I will have the list of the logos shown and whether or not they were manually trained or if they were part of the default model. So these are kind of information I can find in Grafana. Now I can go through each widget or as they call it in Grafana visualization, that would be a little bit boring for you. So let's go into the fact that I have an Axel MAM server, a machine learning server and hardware monitoring. Grafana open source visualization tool, but it needs to gather the data from there from somewhere. And that's why using open source is key, at least to us. It does not make sense to create a dashboard solution that we will need to ask a lot of people to develop against. Now, what makes sense is with open source, you have already a huge community, as Sam mentioned, community of developers that are basically going through the code and fixing, adding more features, but more importantly, adding plugins. What would be a plugin? That would be a mean for you to add a, inform a, a data gathering. So when I will go here and I will go to the data sources, you will see that I have three points that I'm gathering information to. All Grafana does is gives you a visual representation, but I do need to gather this information from somewhere. And I'm gathering from Prometheus, which is a database. It's maybe oversimplification, but that's basically a database where we store hardware information, CPU usage, disk usage, network traffic, uh, CPU temperature, and other things. Axel's backend database the RMAM backend database is PostgreSQL. So we connect to PostgreSQL database and we can query for the user activity, the proxy transcoded and so on. And our machine learning is Mongo. We could potentially tap to Mongo here. There is a Mongo connection points, but I use the REST API. That's my personal preference for plugin, but there are a couple plugins to do REST API calls. And we gather this information after uh, the, we make API calls and gather the information, hence the reporting performance or how many users were, uh, how many pictures were used to train a specific person. So these are three. And why, again, it's important to use something as open as Grafana? Well, let me go to the new point and let's see how many plugins exist if I wanted to, grow, to go to the AstraDB, Azure, 
uh, Analytics from Google, AWS, CloudWatch from Amazon, GitHub, GitLab, uh, Google Sheets, as we have also CSV, we have uh, the Infinity that I already talked to you about, JSON parsing, JSON API, Loki, which is a plugin that will allow you to gather information from logs, log files, so you can suddenly also get all the logs that you have, MySQL, MongoDB, and I can go on, but that's why it made perfect sense for us to go with open source because the the community and the resources for this platform are quite um, vast. So you can find a lot of tutorials, forums, plugins, and so on. So once I have this data source, going back to the three data sources that I used, once I have these three data sources, I will need to query them and show the information. Going back to the home section of this particular dashboard, you will be able to see, for example, for the user activity, I will edit, and you will see basically the query that I have. And I have three queries. They are very simple queries from PostgreSQL. Uh, you can have a lot more complex queries as well. But in this case, I have three queries which basically gather the count of the logins each hour based on the timestamp, and I group them together. And here we are. And that's a time series which allows me to basically update the date range here and have more information. So here's a query one for the logins, query two for metadata edit, and query three for downloads. I could simply add more uh, queries and have more information associated. As long as I have the interval and the time returning my query, I can associate it to a timeline. To, uh, to, I'm sorry, to a time range. Now, you may have other type of information you want to gather. For example, we could try to gather coordinates in, from a video asset that you have in Axel and suddenly have a geo map of where the media comes from. That's a possibility. Now, I do not have any footage to show you that, but that's a possibility. Uh, we can read logs. You can have, so the time series, bar charts, stats, bar gauges, simple tables, pie charts. These are all the visualization you can create. And when I look at the system after, you can modify everything. If I wanted to move, for example, the asset transcribed next to the minutes transcribed and have the proxy transcribed next to the file ingested, ingested, which may visually make more sense, I simply need to move like that and I can start to rearrange everything. And I'm going to save my change. I can make a change. I'm going to save. And now the change has been made. So this is really how Grafana will work. Uh, and you will see here, so that was for PostgreSQL. Let's take this one and look at how I did gather information from the API. I make the API call to my machine learning server. Now we are using reverse proxy. Even though you see a domain that allows me to use my colleague system without him having to open his whole system to the internet. Reverse proxy means there is a server in a cloud who is going to make a phone call to my server and my local network and serve the information securely to the web browser of a client using a domain. But it is not going to expose my, uh, my colleague, in this case, Niels, if you know Neil, uh, it is not going to expose his system to the internet. I'm making phone calls to it using a secure tunnel from the reverse proxy. In any case, I'm gathering the information from the persons and I'm going to then each information format it. Now let's see what it will look like. Let me delete everything and we're going to see what it looks like. I'm gathering a response that will show me as a table and here's all the information. I don't care about the ID. If I wanted to do something with the creation date, I would, but you have all this information, including uh, how many footage may have been problematic for the teaching. Now, I typically delete all the footage that do not work, I delete them. So that's why everything is at zero. But while training, you can find some footage that, uh, not footage, but sample that may, for example, pick up a tattoo and think it's another face or find a face a tattoo and pick up a second face and will not know which face it is. Or in a crowd, and I will have a face in the background. You will have the problematic count here in my Axel AI. 
that the that will allow me to potentially keep track and filter down by clicking on the column and gather the information as to which faces have the more problematic counts and go and rectify that, which is why we could monitoring everything is important. So here's information and I'm just going to add the information I need. So I want their name and I'm going to call it with last actually first name. And then I'm going to grab the surname and I'm going to grab as last name. And I'm going to grab the uh again uh the uh uh profile picture and I'm going to be I'm just going to say uh avatar for example we are just going to make up something and then I will gather the uh uh not video count but media count to know where how often they appear. Uh, so media count is how often they appear, problematic count, and you have also uh, training sample count, which is how many pictures we use to train the model. Uh, actually, I'm just going to use that one, sample count. Oops, let's just fix that. And that's it. Now I will start to have more information, and I can just go ahead and start to fit to, to uh uh, I can start to go ahead and make some changes. For example, well, if I find a field that has the name avatar, I'm going to make a type as a picture or an image. And boom, here we go. I'm changing that. And if I take a sample count, so a field, sorry about that, I actually want to have another field name. Sample count, and I'm going to make it a uh, cell type. I'm going to make it a. Do we want a spark line? Let's see. No, that does not work. So we got to do a gauge, and we go. And I have another gauge going here. I wish I had a little bit more so we can see a little uh, more of the gauge, but uh, I'm going. I'm just going to actually transform that as a number. And here we go. So. There we go. That looks much better. So here's how you can build visualization. If as you, visualization, I'm going to discard that. Visualization are the little widget that you can then move. How did I get the top 10 here? Again, report the face, an API call, gather the faces, and I just made it a pie chart here where I show the values. I wanted to show the value as well so that we see them, uh, but you can basically see, uh, here we go, the different people, some appearing 41 times, 19% of the time. Uh, set a limit, I could say the top five if I wanted to and have only the top five, uh, but that did the top 10 in this case. And here we go. So that's how you can build a pie chart as well and many different type of visualization from data gathering. I'm going to pause a second because I think I covered a lot and I would like to see if we have any questions here. Uh, Sam, you're on mute if you're speaking. Sorry, I, I see you move. Sorry about that. I was saying uh, no open questions right now. Okay. Uh, but maybe if we can take a step back, I mean, this is, I think, giving people an idea of the potential of this platform for media and AI applications. Uh, there's a lot there and it's it's all out there in the world. Like we didn't have to invent 98% of this. The only things that, you know, we did have to do were the, the immediate connections to our AI engines, to our MEM, to our transcoder, uh, and, and to our connector workflow automation. But in principle, this can be connected up to anything. So something like Telestream Vantage or Amazon Recognition or you name your service, both on-premise or in the cloud, uh, this will give you that global view of what's going on. Uh, and I suspect allow people to run much more efficient media processing operations than they could previously. So there's just a lot, a lot of potential there. Um, and surprisingly, Nobody in the media industry has really been bringing this forward. You know, you would have thought with, with some of the larger companies and 
uh, maybe even some of the more innovative small ones, that somebody would say, hey, we could use something like this uh, in media workflows. And we have not seen that. We've seen some proprietary uh, workflow tools, some uh, supply chain automation, for instance, tools that are, that are again, uh, quite quite closed. You know, they, they, they reach out to other things, but in terms of their own design, you have to spend a lot of money to get started and, and it's built around their platform. So there's a kind of lock-in. And we don't think it should be like that. And our customers clearly don't think it should be like that. So, so we're really delighted to be bringing this forward, especially with a couple of months to go before NAB. Uh, but I think in the time between now and NAB, uh, we're also going to be building out more aspects of our kind of open platform story to make it uh, easily understood. And, and just the richness of it, the fact that uh, we're starting with our products, but you can you can plug almost anything into this that that you'd like. So um, ho hopefully that has some 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 real value. Uh, an another aspect is that with AI evolving so quickly and media best practices evolving so quickly, everybody is having to struggle with how they're going to pull together all these disparate tools. Right? You may be using a large language model. To generate new content you may be repurposing content from what you already have you have your existing editing workflows it's just it, the, the world is kind of exploding out there with possibilities and um it, it's not fair to just say let's just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks people are going to build their own paths forward uh, from within all this amazing technology so as they do that it has to be instrumented it has to be visible it has to be you know, understandable, you know, how many total assets do have proxies? Uh, how many assets were archived? Uh, and and it's, it's not reasonable to ask customers to do that all in spreadsheets or for us to build custom reporting modules for, for each use case. But with this, it's drag and drop. It's, it's very accessible. Uh, and again, I hope it catches on with, you know, dozens of vendors, but we've already seen something like that happen in the IT space where clearly it has. And so um, there's no reason why this can't happen uh, in media as well. The other trend I wanna point out, and Patrice did allude to it, is this trend towards wanting to bring more media processing and especially AI on premise. So a lot of the early AI implementations were cloud first because it needed a lot of compute power, a lot of GPU. However, the way things are going right now, and we, we heard this loud and clear uh, when we were at IBC, uh, even going back to NAB uh, in, in, in the spring of last year, is that people want better control over their media. And what's happening is that because of generative AI, there is a ton of potential issues that, that just spring up from sending your media to be processed in someone's uh, large cloud deployment. A great example is about a month ago, I read an article about Amazon recognition. It turns out that their standard terms of service are that when you upload media uh, to, to, for Amazon recognition to search, they retain the right to keep it and use it for future training and future products, including potentially generative AI. So that means if you're a movie studio, if you're a broadcaster or even a corporate client, if you upload stuff in Amazon recognition, and you don't follow every conceivable rule to safeguard your material. I think you had to go like six levels deep in the menus and know where to look and check a box and hope they respect it. If you don't do all of that, Amazon retains the media. And that is really scary. And, and it wasn't scary a couple of years ago because nobody was thinking about this AI stuff. They were just thinking about passive cloud storage, you know, upload stuff to a bunch of buckets and what could go wrong as long as it's password protected and locked down. Fair enough, but now these applications are interrelating using APIs, stuff is being passed all over the cloud, and there's a lot of uh, potential ownership issues, including lawsuits, of course, that have broken out. So anybody that has a large repository of content that they're managing, uh, we are hearing is a lot of anxiety and, and serious practical concern about sending it to the cloud. In addition, there's the economics of sending it to the cloud, which is that these cloud processing services typically charge a per hour or per minute processing fee. And that's for today's technology, for today's 
version of a given tool. But we all know that these tools are evolving really quickly. And that most likely, they're going to be a lot better in a year. So the question then becomes, what happens between now and a year from now? Um, you know, you, you've got the metadata you already paid for. Um, but then you've got to think about a year from now, paying for it all over again for another pass through that algorithm. So it's it's a really problematic concept. It's just like, okay, I spent $10 per hour on 10,000 hours. Let's say that's $100,000. The algorithms just got better. It can recognize more faces. It can recognize more nuances. Great. You have to literally go back from scratch and pay them to process it all over again. Whereas with on-premise media processing, it's able to do that with your existing infrastructure and it's kind of an all-you-can-eat model. You're, you're paying for the license, but you're not paying per processing minute in the cloud. So it's, it's a very compelling model, we think. Between the security concerns and the cost concerns, there's a lot of reasons to, uh, to, to move this kind of processing on-premise. Um, okay, I think a question has come up in, in the chat. Question is, if we use the dashboard, do we have to set up everything on our end? Or will you help set up because it is a bit complex with the queries, responses, et cetera? Absolutely. So while the tool itself is free, we expect to have a business model around the professional services. And we're, we're not really in business to do custom work. But with something like this, there's going to be a standard Axle configuration of the dashboard itself. And then people are going to be able to go ahead and request from us or do themselves uh, their own configuration of it. Uh, but I think for probably the majority of our customers, they'll be able to use the, the standard package out of the box. Where it will get interesting is if they want to tie in storage monitoring, network monitoring, uh, different AI services that they happen to be bringing in, in addition to the ones that we provide. Um, all of that will require a bit of professional services, but orders of magnitude lower cost than if this was a proprietary tool. You'd be into the tens of thousands or, God forbid, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to configure something like this if it was proprietary. But because it's Grafana and all these modules exist, you're really able to hook it up for a half a day here, a half a day there. Uh, it is not rocket science, but that's a great question. The technology, as I mentioned, is, is free to download. Uh, obviously, we've got some modules for it and so forth, but we, we don't intend to be charging for those modules. The idea is that all of our existing customers should, should be able to uh, access this. It's a great opportunity for our customers to, to really have more visibility into their operations and also for us to give a better solution because you'll you'll know more about what's going on with this dashboard approach. It, it's an exciting time. We think this is this is a great thing for our industry. And we're kind of surprised that nobody else has done this. It, you know, there's there's bigger vendors, there's there's vendors with a longer history than Axel uh, uh, that you know could have easily picked this platform in the last few years as it's taken shape. Um, but we haven't really seen anybody else commenting on this. And it's it's a huge trend in the broader IT uh, and web space. So if nothing else, we can bring the message into the industry. Um, and also the other big thing it solves for us is uh, some of these questions of scale. One of the people asked the question about, you know, can Axel handle 20,000 assets? I, I should think so. We, we actually, in, in our next release, we'll be looking to tackle more like 20 million assets. Uh, right now, our typical scale is in the hundreds of thousands or millions of assets. Um, but we believe there's no reason, especially with all the new, more powerful CPUs and GPUs coming out, there is no reason that we can't handle uh, tens of millions of assets uh, over the next year or two and more in the future. There's also a question of scale around metadata, where when you have a lot of AI metadata, each of those assets has way more content associated with it than it did in the past. In the past, you might have, you know, the clip name, the resolution, the codec, and a few comments in the timeline. Now, if you turn on AI, you've got a full transcript, you've got listing of where all the faces appear and disappear, logos, objects, even scene understanding. You know, it's it's like a, a blizzard of additional metadata just for that one asset. And then you need to multiply that um, by thousands or millions. So uh, I think what, what we're going to see is lots more metadata per asset, 
And at the same time, because of shooting ratios and just the nature of the world, lots more assets. And finally, from the storage side, bigger and bigger assets because they're much more often 4K, 6K, and 8K now. Used to be that 1080 was kind of the norm, but I visited a, a municipal video department recently. They're not in a glamorous business. They're not, you know, shooting Hollywood movies or anything. They're shooting all 4K, just to future-proof the content that they capture today. They don't want, you know, the next mayor to come in a few years from now and ask them why all the footage of the previous mayor was so grainy. Uh, so they're just shooting everything in 4K. But as a result, they have over a petabyte of footage. And it's just, uh, you know, it's amazing where petabytes are popping up these days. It's it's pretty much where terabytes used to. Uh, so having a dashboard on all this, find out how, how much storage you have available. Find out how the transcoders are doing, keeping up. Yes, you can get um, servers with 96 cores today, but how busy are those 96 cores? How efficient are they? How many GPUs do you need to add for your AI training? Um, you know, we're, we're not in the land of running everything on one Mac mini, except at our smallest sites nowadays. It's, it's uh, a lot more sophisticated than that. So you need a dashboard at some point. And let me just make sure we have no additional questions. Oh, we do have a couple more questions. Uh, first one, camera to cloud proxy workflow is a huge interest in the current market. And editors can begin working while a DP is still filming. Do you have any thoughts on this or how it can be integrated to the dashboard? Absolutely. So you can run the dashboard in the cloud or on premise. And these camera to cloud workflows are fascinating. And uh, when they are cost effective, they're, they're a great idea. Um, the important thing is that you can monitor almost anything with the dashboard. So it could be how many things landed in S3 buckets. It could be how many things are sitting on premise. Uh, it could be anywhere. And so uh, I think the, the possibilities are, are really pretty wide open. Uh, and then there was a final question. Can we pull videos from cloud and import into Axel? Absolutely. You can you can bring them into local storage and we'll ca catalog it there. But you can also use our Axel Edit product, which is pure cloud. So if you want to just upload to the cloud, in fact, one of our partners is Atomos. And if you look at the Atomos cloud product, uh, they are basically using uh, Axel Edit as the core technology to build Atomos Edit. So you can go out with an Atomos device, push a button, and have all that content sent to the cloud and ready for searching and, and further work, including in browser editing. A final question, and then we're going to wrap. Could the dashboard track which metadata fields have no entries that need to be filled out? Yes, it could. Absolutely. We also have a workflow engine called Connector that can be continuously uh, tracking that as well. So mm -hmm. with Connector, you could actually create action items like send somebody an email and ask them to fill in that form. Um, but with with uh, with Excel dashboard, you can absolutely uh, see, you know, what percentage of the files don't have certain forms filled yeah. out, that kind of thing. Uh, as long as we can write the query, uh, we are going to find a way to visually show you that on Grafana. So absolutely. Great questions, everyone. There was a real flurry there in the last 10 minutes. So much appreciated um, and, and excellent turnout. So thanks, everyone. Uh, look forward to talking soon. And we will see you at, uh, we're doing an ABU event in uh, Malaysia uh, in about a month. And we're, of course, doing NAB uh, in the South Lower Hall again uh, in April. So uh, look forward to seeing some of you there. And thanks for the great attendance. Appreciate it. Thank you.